Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is about the tragic death of eight year old Peter Buckingham, a lovely little boy who wasn't starved, abused, or mistreated. If anything, he was adored. And yet several traumatic incidents led to this innocent little boy being murdered by the one person who loved him the most, his own mum. Murder Mile is researched using the original police files. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details. And as a dramatisation of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 89, The Last Gasp of Peter Buckingham. Today, I'm standing on Milton Avenue in Halsden, NW10. Four streets south of where the first date killer dumped Kate Beagley's bloodied car. Two streets east of the factory where Reg Christie met Muriel Eady. Three streets southwest of the home of the suitcase canal dumper Thomas Kocek. And barely one mile west of the bungled release of Ashrash Amrani. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Halsden is a real hodgepodge. Whereas in the 1900s, it was still a pretty little village on the outskirts of London. As the city's population swelled, Halsden village was swamped by an industrial hub, full of cranes, trucks, trains, and the choking chug of factories. Today it's no different, except that drifting amongst the exhaust fumes, you'll detect the fragrant whiff of fried chicken, cannabis, stale pits, and a confusingly delightful smell as the biscuit factory fires out its ovens. Mmm, toasty biscuits. Unless you live here, Halston isn't the kind of place you'd consciously visit. Yes, it has some sights. Acton Lane Power Station was where parts of Batman and Aliens were filmed. Dennis Nielsen was briefly a local policeman, there's a hospitality company which sends pedants into a spin as they've misspelled the word events with an apostrophe. And even I lived here, in an almost derelict, rat-infested old people's home, where the cockroaches were eaten by the mice, the mice were eaten by the rats, and as the rats eventually died of obesity, the cockroaches moved back in. And although I once saw three mice dancing in my bag of dried couscous, we still received from Brent Council a four-star rating for hygiene. Two streets from Halston Village is Milton Avenue. One side of the street consists of a 1920s terrace, and the other is a mishmash of new builds and maisonettes, now known as Greenwood Terrace. Being heavily bombed during the Second World War, many of the original buildings were demolished long ago, and any memory of this murder has long since been erased. And although, as one of thousands of Londoners who were killed that year, there's no memorial to this little boy, his story is no less tragic. As it was here, on Thursday the 18th of November 1948, in the ground floor flat of 134 Milton Avenue, that a desperate mother felt forced to make a tragic decision and took the life of her own son. This is the only way out. This is what everybody wants. Eleanor Buckingham was either born Eleanor Carey, Eleanor Carg, or Elsinore Carey somewhere in or near the rural village of Finkenberg in Austria, 
on a date close to the 21st of May 1915. But with so many records lost, falsified or destroyed, the first 21 years of her life will remain a mystery forever. And yet if she hadn't felt forced to do something so heartbreaking, like many of us, she would cease to exist. Like so many millions born before her, Eleanor's story is one of insurmountable tragedy and trauma. Raised amongst the snow-capped peaks of the Tyrol Mountains, every day Eleanor breathed in fresh air from the crisp blue skies. She drank the cold clean water from the newly formed mountain streams, and under her feet the soft dewy grass danced. Finkenberg was a tranquil place, so her young life should have been idyllic. But even death can visit paradise. In 1915, as the youngest, Eleanor was one of six siblings in a family of eight. With three babies having died before they were born, the family were already used to pain. But the worst was yet to come. In 1916, the First World War took their father. Then the measles took two boys, chickenpox took a girl, and with the influenza pandemic infecting a third of the world's population over two years and killing close to 100 million people, the family weren't spared and Spanish flu took two more. By 1924, Eleanor was both the youngest, the eldest, and the only child in this devastated family who had survived. And what began as a little farm full of cows and crops, as the plants withered and the cattle keeled over, the only thing they seemed to grow were gravestones. All Eleanor and her mother had left was their home, their lives, and each other. But as the 20s gave way to the 30s, a new horror was looming. In 1934, with the Nazis banned in Austria, Hitler ordered all fascist sympathizers to smash, loot and destroy. Fueled by rabid anti-Semitism, bigotry and a deluded mission to eradicate those who weren't of pure blood, the Nazis persecuted and executed anyone with a traceable Jewish ancestry. Just like Eleanor. In the blink of an eye, everything she had owned or loved was gone. And for nothing she had said or done, she was no longer welcome in her own country. Eleanor was just a small, quiet woman, too shy to speak up and too timid to lash out, with her bitten-down fingernails often trembling and her pale, pained face framed by the frayed ends of the pigtails she chewed. In April 1936, although she had never set foot outside of her village before, clutching a small battered suitcase and barely able to utter a few English words, she fled her homeland and headed towards an uncertain future, unaware that she was escaping an almost certain death in the gas chambers of Auschwitz. In June 1936, Three years before the outbreak of the Second World War, 21-year-old Eleanor Carey arrived in what was still the peaceful and undamaged city of London. Here she was safe. And yet, just eight years later, this doting mother would put her own child to death. Compared to the little rural village of Finkenberg, London was dirty and chaotic. For someone so timid, the city was a terrifying, noisy cacophony. Here she couldn't sleep, she couldn't breathe, and everything was slathered in soot. Nothing was soft, fresh or natural. It never got dark and it never went silent. But seeing the city as her sanctuary from death, slowly, this crazy chaos became her new normal. 
In April 1934, Eleanor embraced England as her own, and she became a naturalized British citizen. In June 1939, just 10 weeks before the Second World War was declared, and with Austria under the jackboot of Nazi control, Eleanor married James Buckingham, a lovely older gentleman who, being aware of her frayed nerves owing to a turbulent childhood, he was always kind, devoted, and patient. And as if some kind of divine being had witnessed her tragic little life and decided that, for once, she deserved to be given a bit of a break. On the 16th of May 1940, the recently married Eleanor Buckingham was blessed with not just a baby boy, but she gave birth to twins. John and Peter were perfect. Two pasted little bundles of joy, all wrinkly and bald, chubby and helpless. And although both boys were born with two arms, two legs, ten fingers and ten toes, Eleanor couldn't help but worry. She knew she'd been blessed, so unlike her three unborn siblings, both of her babies made it through to birth. Unlike her older brothers and sisters, some who didn't survive into infancy, her boys dodged every childhood illness. And in a small Hampstead flat, thick with the steam of a never-ending cycle of wet towels, drying sheets, and nappies bubbling on a boil wash, solely owing to their doting mother, both John and Peter made it through their first year unscathed. Eleanor was a fighter, but still, her life wasn't without its challenges. With the Nazis snapping at her heels, the threat of a German invasion in her new homeland became a real possibility. Being in the grip of rationing, everything her babies needed was in short supply, but they never went without. And with her husband James being too old to enlist and too crippled to return to a better paid job as a labourer, earning very little as a night watchman, it meant that when he worked, she slept, and when he slept, she worked. So although the newlyweds rarely saw each other, their life just about ticked along. But through it all, Eleanor fought on. Anyone who ever met them said that the Buckinghams were a delightful family and that at the centre of it all was Eleanor. At the inquest, the words of her friends and neighbours never once wavered. To her beloved boys, she was a good mother. She would do anything to feed them, anything to clothe them and anything to protect them. But no one ever thought that, in order to keep them safe, she would do the unthinkable. Between the 7th of September 1940 and the 11th of May 1941, the Luftwaffe unleashed an aerial assault on Britain. No longer attacking strategic targets, but striking populated areas instead. As the Allied forces were outmatched, and ill-prepared to repel such a devastating and unrelenting attack. For eight months, day and night, German bombers rained down wave after wave of bombs, mines and incendiaries, as the Nazis sought to pummel Britain into submission. But it failed. People were dead, lives were ruined and cities had fallen. And yet, life went on. For the sake of her twin boys, Eleanor had embraced the British way of life, as with a straight back, a stiff upper lip and a mid-digit to Adolf. The order of the day was to keep calm and carry on. So as ordinary people went about their everyday lives, it wasn't uncommon to head to the local shops only to find rubble, for the death of a friend to casually crop up in conversation and to dodge body parts as he walked the bomb-damaged streets. As things really were, here today and gone tomorrow. 
Like so many others, this became Eleanor's new routine. And as the distant bombs dropped, she washed, she cooked, she cleaned. And as the bangs and shakes grew louder and nearer, with John and Peter tucked under each arm, she'd sprint into the nearest air raid shelter to endure yet another sleepless night and restless day. As babies cried, bombs dropped, and the world around her was smashed. Through it all, she stayed strong for her boys. But the unrelenting trauma took his toll. Being in her late twenties, her skin was now wrinkled, her hair was grey, and even a knocked pot made her flinch. So after almost 262 days of constant death and destruction, as the blitz ceased, the bombing didn't just stop. Instead, for the next three years, it became unpredictable. On the 3rd of June 1944, the Hampstead flat of the Buckingham family was hit. Thankfully, the bomb wasn't a direct hit, so although it shattered windows and splintered doors, it was enough to knock out a wall, but nothing more. Outside of the smouldering ruins of their home, Eleanor sat as she cradled her four-year-old boys. Both were a little bruised and a little dirty, but unharmed. So when James returned home, being relieved to see that his family was safe, he reassured his silent and motionless wife not to worry. But as they would soon discover, some things could never be fixed. Being homeless, the Buckingham family salvaged what they could, borrowed what they had to, and with so few safe and habitable homes left standing, they moved into a ground floor flat in Harlesden. Milton Avenue wasn't great. Being a major industrial junction, the parks of Hampstead were replaced by thundering trains. The rubble-strewn street was pockmarked with bomb craters. Everything was buckled or smashed. So with this part of the city still a prime target for the Luftwaffe, as the second wave of the Blitz pummeled London in one final push, along each side of this two-story terrace were the ghostly shells of what were once family homes. Everything was tinged with death. And although this little flat was too small for a family of four, it had a roof, walls, floors, and in a small kitchenette, a simple gas oven. So for now, they may do. As Eleanor returned to her usual routine, as she washed, she cooked, and she cleaned. On the 30th of April 1945, with Adolf Hitler dead, the war was finally over. But Eleanor's battle had only just begun. Across the smoky ruins of the city, as the people cheered, children played, and jubilant church bells rang out, Eleanor should have been elated. But this tiny nervous lady, who was still only 30, had witnessed enough trauma to last a lifetime. Her body was frail, her brain was fried, her smile was gone, and her nerves were shot. Two days later, being unable to cope, Eleanor took an overdose of aspirin. One week later, having almost recovered, she attempted suicide again. On the 8th of May 1945, Eleanor was committed to Shenley Mental Hospital in Hertfordshire, a new psychiatric facility regarded as the cutting edge in mental health. It offered rest, relaxation and recuperation, as well as innovative treatments such as viral therapy, drug-induced comas, insulin injections and electroconvulsive therapy, a successful treatment for major depressive traumas. Administered a course of ECT, Eleanor showed much improvement, 
as over the weeks, she became calmer, happier, and healthier. But having never been apart for so long from her twin boys, the longer she stayed here, the more anxious she became. On the 28th of July, 1945, after 10 weeks away, Eleanor Buckingham was discharged from Shenley Hospital. Upon her return to Milton Avenue, she was reassured by familiar things. Her tiny little flat, her doting husband, and of course, her babies. She was home, but home was full of nothing but bad memories. And now, on every radio, in every newspaper, were reminders of what this former Austrian had potentially fled. Images of the Holocaust, of the death camps, of the rotting bodies, and of the gas ovens. And having attempted suicide a further three times, on the 5th of November 1946, Eleanor was readmitted to Shenley Hospital. With her delusions darker, her self-hatred deeper, and paranoid that the nurses had stolen her babies, Eleanor repeatedly escaped from Shenley. And although a second course of ECT did show some improvement, against the advice of the hospital's superintendent, James petitioned for her release, and after five months away, Eleanor was discharged. Eighteen months later, she did the unthinkable. Like most days, Thursday the 18th of November 1948 was a living nightmare. The Buckingham family was stuck in a no-win situation, as whether at home or in hospital, Eleanor only got worse. Her language was foul, her moods were manic, and petrified that the neighbours were conspiring to kill her, and gripped by the terror of being sent back to Shenley Hospital, her life was one long paranoid delusion. At 7.30pm, James headed out on yet another 12-hour night shift. With Eleanor becoming more violent, he never felt that she would hurt their boys, as only he was the brunt of her abuse, and only his face bore her scars. And although she had threatened to kill her kids, he knew that she never would. As everyone would later testify, Eleanor was a good mum. She was loyal, loving, and devoted to her eight-year-old twin boys, John and Peter. She would do anything to protect them. Anything. That night was no different. She made her boys a light supper of vegetable stew. She washed their faces. She brushed their teeth. She dressed them both in vests and underpants. And having kissed their foreheads, she put them both to bed. With the icy winter wind howling, the old house drafty, and the coal fire out of fuel, on the floor of the kitchenette she placed a mattress. And as all three of them snuggled up together under a duvet, they were soothed by the warmth of the gas oven as mother and her babies drifted off to sleep. During the night, John awoke. With his skin shivering, his eyes stinging, his head pounding, and his lungs spluttering. Unsure if this was a nightmare, all he knew was that, with the gas oven off, the kitchen was dark and cold. In her arms, he saw his mother feverishly rub his brother's frozen limbs. And as she carried the limp boy into the bedroom, and tucked him under a duvet. John followed. But as he snuggled up to Peter, he could feel that the bed was as icy cold as his brother. Still feeling drowsy, it didn't take long till John drifted back to sleep, and although his twin was still and silent, his mother was not. As she sat on the bed, 
beside her two boys and rocking back and forth, repeating, It's still warm. It's still okay. It's still warm. It's still okay. But Peter wasn't okay. At 8.55 a.m., when James returned home, as he entered his hallway, he was hit by the smell of gas, but the gas tank was drained. In the kitchenette, the oven's taps were open, but all the gas had gone, and in the bedroom was what remained of his family. Eleanor and John were both treated for carbon monoxide poisoning, and they made a good recovery. But Peter, who was the smallest, the weakest, and the nearest to the gas taps, had inhaled the most of this invisible, odorless poison. At 10.20 a.m., eight-year-old Peter Buckingham was pronounced dead. There were no signs of violence, abuse, or struggle. And given the type of oven, experts declared it was impossible for the gas taps to be turned on by mistake. Eleanor Buckingham was charged with murder, attempted murder, and suicide by asphyxiation, to which she confessed, I was doing the three of us, but I just couldn't stand it. The gas made us sick. It's Shenley Hospital I'm afraid of. I didn't want to go back, so I was taking my two children with me. At her brief trial, the jury took into account the traumas she had suffered. Her diseased siblings, her dead parents, the Nazis, the war, the Blitz, and the bomb blast. And although no one doubted her undying devotion and love for her boys, even though she had survived so much, the biggest horrors she faced were the ones she could never escape. On the 8th of December 1948, at the Old Bailey, having been certified insane and declared unfit to stand trial, Eleanor Buckingham was found guilty of willful murder by reason of insanity. She was detained at His Majesty's pleasure and was sent to Broadmoor Psychiatric Prison, where her fate is unknown. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget, after hopefully a brief advert, Although you never know, I shall be saying some random words and moving about my boat as I make a cup of tea, eat a cake, and generally waste a lot of air. But before that, a big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Oliver Hepworth, Stacy, John Dane, Jennifer Green, Anna White, and Melanie Gudgel. I thank you. I hope you all enjoy the thank you cards and goodies, and that you're staying safe and well. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with no name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. <sighs> Bloody hell. Oh. Oh, Christ. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, open some curtains a bit. Oh, dear, that was slightly harder to do that one. There was a goose that kept coming past, going, it was one goose by itself and it was really lonely and it was trying to find its buddies and it kept going back and forth past the boat. There's no gooses here except that one. It's going, meh, meh. Every, every like second, and it's like, oh, 20 minutes of this I couldn't record. Oh, anyway, right, hello everyone, extra mile, blah, 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 extra mile, here we are, extra mile, uh, unscripted, unedited, this is why I waffle a bit, I make a cup of tea, I have a bit of a cake, fill you in and hopefully some details towards this case. So, right, first things first, oh, go make a cuppa. <coughs> Oh, my hip just popped. My hip just popped out. 
I'm gonna make a cup of tea, got a cake. Uh, la, 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 la. Right, hang on. Uh, tea time. Today's, yep, tea as always is gonna be a PG tips. PG time, PG tips gotta be done. Hopefully you can hear me a little bit better this time because I've changed my kind of setup that I'm using. So hopefully you can hear me a bit better. Maybe not, I don't know. Uh, we're all coming back. This is uh, today's cake. What is the cake of the day? This is very exciting. Hang on, let me see how long I've done. Right, okay, cake of the day is oh, chocolate, chocolate twist. It's like a, a long pastry in a twist. There's some kind of uh, jammy thing in the middle and then there's lots of chocolate sprinkles and things around it. So that's going to be very nice. Looking forward to that. Uh, hope you're all well and staying safe. Um, obviously, we're all still in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, uh, hope everyone's staying safe, just staying sane. Keep, the, keep yourselves busy. That's the important thing. Get a routine. But more importantly, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people doing this. A lot of people posting pictures of themselves wearing masks. Don't seem to be seeing a lot of people wearing gloves. I know there's a lot of people walking around wearing, got the masks on, no gloves. And as we all know, it's the gloves that are the important, the masks. Unless unless you're ill or you're in the healthcare profession and you need to wear them, wear them. But if you don't need to wear them, don't wear them. They're not fashion accessories. As it's already been said, if you're wearing masks and you don't need to wear a mask, there are risks that you're spreading the virus around just by doing that. Gloves are what you need to do, or washing your hands, as they're saying. People don't seem to be understanding the rules, or keeping your distance from people. I think a few weeks in, a lot of people are becoming complacent, so even though I don't mean to be preachy, I will be with this. Wash your hands, or use the antiseptic. I'm using the antiseptic um, gels on my hands, and I'm using gloves everywhere. It's weird, I go into shops and people are looking at me like, where's his gas mask, or you know, whatever mask we were meant to be wearing, and it's like, well... I'm not in a healthcare pro care profession. I'm not. I'm currently no longer looking after people who are ill. Haven't got. You know, I only need to wear gloves, and I do. I'm thorough with my gloves, and I come home and I wash my hands. Do you know? So, I'm helping not spread it. But there's a lot, a lot of people doing their selfies online and going, "Oh, look at me! I'm wearing my gas mask." And it's like, yeah, that's fine, but where's your bloody gloves? Do you know? Obey the rules. Do you know these cases of infection are going up by a hundred thousand a day at the moment across the world? Hundred thousand a day. And it's because people aren't obeying the rules. They're not social distancing. They're not keeping their distance. They're not washing their hands. It's it's all to do with touching things and putting it near your face. And that's how you get the infection. <sighs> rant over, rant over. Um, just to say, everyone, uh, uh, you may have noticed there was a bit of a feed drop in the episode recently for a, a podcast called Immaculate Deception hope you don't mind about that this is just a bit of an apology for me normally i would say no to kind of a feed drop like that but obviously times are hard things are difficult we're all kind of short on money uh so uh i i said yes to it but what i did first was uh I, they'd already released two episodes so i listened to both episodes of immaculate deception it's a story about a kind of a fertility doctor who they found out years later not really a spoiler um he'd used his own sperm to inseminate all of these women and it's kind of like now there's all of a sudden there's loads of children out there who are all his children but these women never knew that they thought it was you know donor sperms but it was in a way but it was kind of illegal donor sperms so uh, i listened to that i thought it was really interesting um uh so that's why there was a feed drop in there uh, so I hope people don't mind about that. Um, it's not going to be a regular thing. I normally don't like. I don't like it because you see it online and people go, "Oh, do you know?" If you're with what, if you listen to a lot of wondery podcasts, they do a feed drop at the same time, and I see people get very agitated about it, and rightfully so. You you look at your feed list, and it, all it says is "new clip for this," and it's like, oh, like twenty versions of the same shit. So uh, it won't be a regular thing, but. They offered me money. It was it was easy money, and I thought I have to do it the, because wh where's the next penny going to come from? We don't know. How long is this going to last? We don't know. So I hope you don't mind. It keeps me in cake. Right, and my tea's up. Tea's up. As always, let it stew. I treated myself to uh, a nice big flask this week. I know it's very exciting. 
because I realised I make a lot of tea during the day, and because we don't know how long things are going to last, we also don't know how long gas is going to last. And because I'm not connected to the mains, uh, I I run off gas tanks on here, and I can they last about well, like one will last three months, and I have two, but there is a risk that uh, they could, you know. Who knows whether the gas is going to expire? So I can, I'm trying to eke out my gas. I've got enough for about six months, I reckon, without getting some more gas tanks. But you never know. You never know. So that's why I'm trying to be cautious, I'm trying to conserve water and things like that. So uh, you know, how, this could this could all be wrapped up in a couple of in a month or two. It could be um, it could be wrapped up uh, in a year. Um, uh, you know, you never know. Um, just just what just wanted to say a kind thank you to everyone whoa who sent um oh, i can't do uh, struggling um just a thank you to everyone who just a thank you to everyone who sent nice messages um as as your podcast isn't broken, I assure you. Um, just to say, as many of you probably know, uh, my mum passed away. Um, and all, all of you sent really lovely messages. So just, just to say that, that really meant a lot. It really did. I, I didn't get to reply to them. I, I kind of clicked, you know, like, so everyone knew that I'd seen it. But I, I, I did read them all and thank you very much. So that was that was really lovely. Uh, obviously this was a difficult episode to write um, the first half of it I wrote um, knowing that mum was dying and the second half I wrote after she died so but uh, but it was good Do you know it's been a it's been a difficult difficult week two weeks but um, uh, but it was good in a way, you know, I, I did my writing because we're under these extreme conditions at the moment where we can't travel and we can't see people and we can't, you know, you've got to be cautious about seeing people who are elderly and infirm and, and at risk. That was the thing, you know, mum's been ill for a long time and we've had a lot of false starts when they've, because she's, she's tiny, but she's got a real, she's, she's strong willed and she's stubborn and she's got a real cast iron constitution uh and she can put up with a lot of you know years of kind of all the medications she's been on her body is actually it, it looks weak but it's actually a hell of a lot stronger than people give her credit for i'm uh, still talking about her in the present tense um and uh many, many times she's kind of you know, we've got the call it's like mum's dying and it's like okay we rush down there we say our goodbyes and then the next the next day like she'll go from being catatonic to up on her feet and like hello how's everyone doing blah, blah, blah. and it's like and the doctors are like we have no idea what's going on and i'm not blaming the doctors it's literally mum's condition was we, we still don't know what it is it's uh, it, she had multiple conditions it was all over the shop her body was a mess but she could bounce back from things she could bounce back from the dead and we said goodbye so many times so like about two weeks ago, my brother said, look, um, they, they, they don't think mum's going to make it. And we were like, yeah, <laughs> ha, 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 yeah, whatever. That's yeah, We've heard that one before. I'll see you next time. It's like, we're, we're, it's, it's dark humour, but we're kind of used to it now. Um, but then it was, it was my brother was like, no, because uh, he lives local. So he's, he got to see mum every day. And he was like, no, this is, this is really it. It's like the, the end of life nurses are out where we're discussing the end of life medications um mum hadn't she'd come out of hospital she's got an infection she was you know a lot going on and um she oh she was i think she'd just given up by that point you know she was she didn't she wasn't accepting water she wasn't accepting food she wasn't accepting medications but she would accept painkillers and the end of life drugs so by the time I did, I was I didn't think I'd get to travel because of this infection. I didn't want because it's a care home and it's full of lots of invulnerable people. I wanted to see mum, but I didn't want to pass. If I had germs, I didn't want to get on a dirty train, get on a dirty tube, get there in the care home, make people ill, make the staff ill. Do you know, as much as my needs were there, I didn't want to. I didn't want to hurt other people. Um, but 
so I was halfway through writing this. I almost went there, and then I, I stopped. Thought I can't do it. I can't make people ill. But the next day, the Friday, was it the Friday? Yeah, the last Friday, I was like, no, sod it. I messaged my brother. I said I have to come up. I have to. I have to say goodbye, even if it's just through a window or something. I have to see mum, say goodbye. So I did it. Very few trains. I'd say it's, she's like a hundred and sixty miles away. So I cycled a big chunk of it. Got on a train, empty ghost train, made it there. My brother was there. I think it was good. I think it was good that I was there because I think he was struggling a bit, and I think he needed someone by him. And we, you know, we had we were able to have a good chat, and it was nice to have a regular conversation. We had that. Mum was catatonic, so she couldn't say anything, but we were able to have a conversation. I think that was nice for nice for her to have her sons beside her, just having a regular conversation. It made it. She seemed to be a lot more calmer. We were able to stroke her head. She was very calm, and it, it gave me time to kind of over the next 36 hours to kind of see mum and uh i think i think the last the last hour was difficult because it was like even even though we she like she'd survive for like in the end it was 18 days without food and water it was her decision it, it was her last decision it's what she wanted to do she wouldn't take anything on board so she she survived a lot longer than like 10 days is how long you meant to last she lasted 18 and then even the nurses were coming in going this is, uh, we've no idea how she's lasting this long she just kept going and going and going but um because of the friday i knew i had to get back i knew i didn't want to be there in, in case i cause more of a problem there so I knew that I was going to have to leave at some point because they were still saying she could last another another week who knows uh, to the Friday I was there I, the last hour I was I knew that my train was soon uh, and that was that was the hard bit the hard was the last hour knowing that this was going to be the last time I'd ever see her but you know it was good I'm glad I'm glad I made the journey because it was good I, I got to see her I got to say goodbye, kiss, kiss mum's forehead. You know, told, told her I loved her. Wished her a safe... A safe journey. And a few hours later, she was gone. But... I was getting... So... But at least she's... You know, it was her dis her choice she did it on her terms which is the way she would have liked it um and you know what she's she's doing she's better now she's not in a you know having all the illnesses she had especially dementia and stuff like that you know it must be quite frightening so you know she's at peace now so uh we've got the funeral in about two weeks uh and then and then another one will be coming up this year as well so it's 2020 has been a bit of a bastard for all of us isn't it but that's what it is uh so just uh thank you to everyone for their lovely messages that was really nice of you really kind of you really helped me along um uh, also a special thank you to S cynthia uh, sent a very kind donation um um it, uh, in relation to this so uh, what i'm gonna do there's only gonna unfortunately because of funerals you can only have five people at funerals now and all funerals are being limited to just a couple of minutes because there's so many that they have to have there's just not the staff to do them and i totally get that so uh there's only going to be a few of us at mum's funeral there'll be me my brother sister-in-law one of oh, one of mum's friends and two people from the care home uh we hope uh so that'll be good it's just just a selection of people from um from her life and i will i'm going to buy them each a drink with that donation so that's very kind of you cynthia so thank you very much ah uh, that was cheerful wasn't it uh and it, that's why this was a hard episode to write because it's a mum a story about a mum with lots of mental health problems and uh oh i think i've related too much to it um so right questions questions quiz time let's do this bloody quiz and then we'll do some more information on this right everyone ready question number one oh the cake looks too good i could take cake looks too good and the tea's right here uh question number one what was the name of the hospital um eleanor was committed to 
good hospital. It still exists today, and it's. Uh, I'll, I'll try and post some pictures of it. Uh, question number two: Name both of the places that the Buckingham family lived in London. Question number three: Name the village Eleanor came from in Austria. As always, uh, I should mention that if uh, if uh, some of these questions disappear, like I go from one to five or, or one to one, two, three, five, six, it's because I've had to edit that bit out of the story. Therefore, I'll edit out of the question as well. But some weeks I might forget. What were, question four? What were the three possible names of Eleanor? I had to stop myself then. What were the three possible names of Eleanor? Uh, <laughs> um. I'll explain all this later, later. Question five. What did James, her husband, do as a job? Question six. What killed off her family, her original family, her mum, her dad, uh, her brothers and sisters? Uh, what was the twin boys' final meal? Question eight. Where did she spend the rest of her life? After obviously after uh, um, uh, her court uh, the the trial at the old bailey uh what tr uh, question number 9 what treatments did they offer at the shenley hospital and question 10 over the smell of car fumes cannabis and chicken shops what is the unusually sweet smell you can detect in harlston <laughs> it's a familiar smell that i i've uh, Smelt many times. You can say you can smell it on the on the canal going past because the canal goes through Harlston as well. It, the, the canal is literally at the back of this street as well, so it's an inter. It's a weird intersection. It's an intersection of a very busy road, a main train route, canal system, and Acton Lane power stations. And and then next to that is the McVitie's factory. So it's a, it's a real, it's a bit of a mess of a place. But you can you can as you go through you can smell horrible smoke and things but then you can smell McVitie's biscuits and I know I know it's not them making the biscuits because my dad when he was a teenager used to work in a biscuit factory and he said when you can smell a really really biscuity smell it's not them making the biscuits it's them firing out the ovens to get to burn out all of the all of the biscuits that stuck and that's what you can smell it's normally around three o'clock um this was one of those cases uh found in the National Archives um I uh, didn't know anything about it, just did a little bit of a search. Uh, I can't remember how I found this one. They have a search function there, and I used it, and I thought, oh, okay, yeah. Um, um, it, all it said was, Eleanor Buckingham killed Peter Buckingham, aged eight and a half. And I thought, child murder could possibly be good, could be bad. Case turned up, the case file, pulled out the file. The file was barely 15 pages long. It was tiny, and I thought, oh, God. This is really not going to be, you know, there won't be enough in there to tell me. But I, and I read it. It was simple. It didn't really go to trial. It didn't go to major trial because it was pretty much open and shut. She had, she confessed to it. She had a long history of mental illness. Um, she'd, she'd said that she was going to try and kill her children before she did. So that's really all it was. But, and even though it was a tiny file, I'll post a picture of it online because normally they're big and fat. This was a tiny little sliver of a file, but I read it and it was sad and I could really relate to the story. And I just thought, do you know what? Even though it's going to be a nightmare to try and research all of these, all this information that's not in there, it will take me a long time. But I think it'll be worth it in a way. So just to say, as I mentioned in the story, the first 21 years of her life, a lot of it is based around people who knew her, but at the time of the murder so this is obviously like 10 15 years after you know she died when she well she she was uh convicted when she was 33 so a lot of these people wouldn't have known her from austria so a lot of these details may not be correct about her early life but this is what people have said so i've tried to fashion it into a story which is why her date of birth may be wrong uh she oh Oh, I can't give away too much because this is the quiz. Uh, her name may be wrong. I'll explain why as well. Her name was a nightmare. Her mum's name was a nightmare. It was uh, oh, really difficult to, to piece all this together. But you know what? I, um, uh, when he knows, not coronavirus. So um, hopefully <clears throat> I've been able to fashion a, a story out of it. 
um, may, uh, um, which is why the the quiz is slightly more difficult this week because it's it's kind of like there wasn't that many f- facts that were in there, but there was a lot more about her and her, what what was her thought process, what was going through her mind. So, although she never really gave any statements about what's going through her mind, because we know that the the trauma was caused by past trauma, but also the blitz or the bombings being involved in that bombing as well. Unfortunately, uh, when when where her house was in Hampstead when that blew up, we don't know. It wasn't listed, so uh, that's a little bit vague as well. But so we we only know really know details of what uh, people's statements have said. Uh, what we did get, we got a statement from uh, James, the father, all about their life. We got a statement from John, who was the other twin, the one who survived. He gave a statement. All the neighbours gave statements. The police gave statements. The pathologists, so all those were in there, but it was kind of quite limiting. Uh, I changed a couple of things around in the story just because it, it was a little bit confusing when I read it because it was um, the mum had actually got one of the mattresses moved it out of the bedroom next to the fire oh no no we did that that was right but then but then there was a whole story about moving mattresses and it just got really really confusing so i tried to keep things as simple as possible um so uh, the twin brother said peter went to bed first in the big bed in our bedroom which was where they'd end up eventually mummy and i brought a mattress from a single bed into the kitchen and laid it on the floor that was in front of the fire Mummy carried Peter into the kitchen and put him on the mattress so he was already fast asleep. I went to bed on the mattress beside Peter. M- Mummy stayed up. Uh, she eventually, she she said later on that she joined them in bed. Uh, I must have been asleep when Mummy went to bed. During the night I woke up and Mummy was trying to carry Peter. She told me he was too heavy. Mummy did carry him through to the bedroom and put him in bed. He wasn't moving at all. After that... I went to my own bed, the large one, in the bedroom and got inside with Peter. He's kind of repeated himself there. Um, uh, Mummy got on the single bed in our bedroom. The light was switched off and I went to sleep again. Early in the morning. See, I I missed out this bit about the early morning because it's kind of repetition. But early in the morning, when it was light, Mummy woke me and told me Peter was dead. I looked at Peter. He was still beside me. I tried to wake him, but he was too stiff. After that, mummy got dressed and so did I and we sat in the bedroom. I sat there till daddy came in. Mummy never spoke to me. She sat holding her head. I thought that was a nice scene to do, but then I realised that when we get to the end of the story, we've kind of already done that. We've kind of already, we already know that's happening and, you know, what we need to get to is the father coming back and seeing what what has happened. Um, An autopsy was held that day uh, by Dr Donald Tear at Kilburn Coroner's Court Mortuary. They said that Peter died of asphyxia due to carbon monoxide poisoning. There was a small quantity of blood froth around his nose and lips. Uh, He was in a state of rigor mortis and there were no signs of violence. Obviously, the blood around his his nose and mouth is consistent with um, um, asphyxia. Uh, The back of his body was cherry pink, which is a sign of hypoxia. And fine blood-stained froth from his air passages. So that's consistent with uh, hypoxia and... uh, Oh, the other one that I said, my brain's not working. Uh, There was a large, uh, partially undigested vegetable meal in his stomach. He was well nourished, as they always say in all autopsy reports. People hate reading that, but they have to start it with the words, they were well nourished. Uh, (laughs) uh, He had no diseases, no illnesses, no disabilities. Uh, In the investigation, the gas cooker was investigated. It was a H. Scott number one bungalow type cooker fitted in 1936 it was examined by harry wren examiner for the gas light and coke company he confirmed there were there were no defects with the appliance uh hence there would be no uh no one could claim it was accidental poisoning and the gas taps could not be turned on accidentally uh and when they investigated the meter because it was a gas supply uh you put in like a shilling and then it gives you gas for a period of time uh it was the the meter was empty when they examined it so obviously eleanor had uh the kids were fast asleep she switched on the gas taps she curled up with the kids went to sleep the gas ran out so either she didn't put enough money in or you know uh as john did she woke up and started coughing and as she said she didn't she didn't like it it was making her sick um so um she stopped 
uh, or they moved in the other room, but Peter, by that point, Peter was already dead. Uh, they looked around the room. Uh, there were cracks in the fireplace and cracks above the walls and the windows, because obviously it's a bit of a rickety old house, but she hadn't stopped them up. She hadn't blocked them. So uh, although they said there was no hint of premeditation there, you know, she hadn't gone around the house to making sure that it was airtight, uh, they still knew that she had attempted uh, to take her children and herself with her. Uh, she was mentally assessed at Holloway Prison on the 19th of uh, November. That was the next... Oh, no, she was held at Holloway Prison 19th of November till the 4th of December. That was during... Um, in the build-up to her trial. She was certified as insane, suffering from paranoid delusions. She was sullen. Um, she either... she said They said the, she either ignores those around her or fiercely glares at them. When spoke to, uh, she will ignore that person, but will only reply when they have gone. Uh, she's paranoid. She feels persecuted. Doctors, she claims that doctors at Shenley are double crosses. They twist facts, and they wanted her and her children. As mentioned, they, uh, she reckoned they wanted to steal her children. Uh, she refuses refused to talk. She refuses food, and was declared unfit to stand trial. Uh, um, trial was held. Uh, the initial. Um, coroner's trial was held on the 19th of november 1948 that was the next day um sorry that was the morning that was the the, the day of the uh the bodies being found at wilsden magistrates court she the, she was remanded to the 25th of november and it just, this was paid for by the poor prisoners defense act of 1930 which is uh that still technically is in force today uh trial was held at the central criminal court which is the old bailey on the 8th of december 1948 judge streetfield charged her with the willful murder of her son peter she was represented by mr glynn prosecution uh, and the prosecution was mr hawks the trial opened with her mental condition uh dr thomas christie md not related to that Christie of Holloway prison stated that she was insane and unable to appreciate the charge against her. Hence she was uh, declared uh, uh, insane and unable to stand trial. So they, the, 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 the trial took place, but she wasn't there. Uh, the jury were asked to deliver a verdict based on the evidence and finding her unfit to plead, unfit to plead. She was detained at his majesty's pleasure. Uh, she, as mentioned, she was taken to Broadmoor Psychiatry Prison, and that is where it ends. There, I can't really find anything more about her. Uh, and that was kind. Of, that was kind of it. Uh, I tell you what, let's go through the the questions. <gasps> Have a swig of tea. I'm still looking at that cake. Yummy. Uh, still looking at that cake. It looks good. Um, Right, I'm going to answer the questions and then that fills in a couple of gaps that we've got here. So, what was the name of the hospital she was committed to? Well, I've mentioned that about, about 50 times already. So you probably already got that. It was Shenley Hospital over in Hertfordshire. Uh, question number two. Name both the places they lived in London. They were Halsden, which was Milton Avenue, and the second one was in Hampstead. The Hampstead address isn't listed in the file uh, it's too early. Well, we're about 20 years too early for the census records. Uh, it was a rented flat, so their details probably wouldn't crop up anywhere. So I've had a good old look around. Um, unfortunately, I can't find out where this address was. I did go through all the bomb charts for uh, Hampstead because we knew roughly the date of when their house was bombed. But there were so many bombings in and around Hampstead. Hampstead's a big area as well. Uh, I just couldn't narrow it down, so I, I, I kept it vague. Because just because we don't know, uh, what was the name of the village she came from in Austria? Uh, it was Finkenberg. Although I have written, I have in this, I've I've put in or near Finkenberg, but this could have been the place that she was registered there, or she could have been born elsewhere and taken back to Finkenberg, or her family could have been on holiday there. I don't know. It's just it, it says born in or near Finkenberg, so I've had to stick with that it's this is why this story is difficult because there's nothing in her history and i don't think i think because we've only got james to work on uh all he knows is what she told him about her early life so this is based on what she said to him and what he recalls all these years later so it's hard to, it's it's that's why it's a hard story to pull off and there's no real documentation out there and what there is is vague 
Uh, but we'll get to that now. What question four? What were her possible? What were her three possible names? This is where it gets difficult. Um, one possible name, which is the one I've stuck with that most people seem to have used, is Eleanor Carey. Uh, she was also Eleonora Carey. Uh, sorry, Eleonora Carg, which could be a spelling mistake, or Elsinore Carey. Uh, on her marriage certificate, it's misspelt. Uh, her mother's name on the birth certificate is possibly also misspelt. Her details on her naturalisation certificate is misspelt. Uh, her death certificate is mis misspelled. And obviously, because she's born in Austria, we don't have a birth certificate. Um, so uh, because we didn't know, we didn't didn't know her family's names, uh, didn't know any names of her siblings, didn't know her father's name. Someone did say that her mother's name was Sabine, but I, I can't find any version of that anywhere. Um, also, we don't know what happened to her mother. I, it, literally, in this story, we know what happened to her. Her father died, or apparently. The siblings died, apparently, but I can't prove any of that. But this is what people have said. Uh, her mother, her mother just disappears. Literally, she's with her mother. And then one thing I seem to have read is that her mother did make it with her to London. But... I can't find any details of her mum in London at all. I've tried different pet variations of the name. Nothing. Nothing there. So maybe her mum didn't make it. We don't know. This is why this story is so vague. Uh, question five. What did James do as a job? We know what he did as a job. Thank God. Uh, this was uh, because he said he was a petrol pump attendant and a night watchman. Um, I didn't put this in the story because I took it out, but uh, he was based at a place called Jeffrey Davies, which was a car dealership on Neasden Lane, uh, NW10, so not too far away. Um, what killed off her family? This, again, is dubious, but this is what we're told, so this is what I'm working on, but it could be wrong. Uh, in 1916, the First World War took their father. That's all we know is he, he was taken whether he was fighting, we don't know. Whether he was just a, a casualty, we don't know. Um, the measles apparently took two boys. Chickenpox took a girl. And the influenza pandemic, how appropriate, uh, infected a third of the world's population over two years and killed clo well, it's between, between 50 to 100 million people. People who probably didn't wash their hands. Wash your hands. Wear gloves. Wash your hands. Uh, so, yeah, two more took... Two more of her, her siblings were taken. She may have had more siblings. I don't know. This is still very vague. And as mentioned, what happened to her mother? We don't know. Just don't know. Uh, what was the twin boy's final meal? Just mentioned that. That was vegetable stew. Uh, although there could have been meat in there. We don't know. But um, they didn't seem to find when they went through the kid's stomach. They didn't find any meat. So, And the meal was... Well, it wouldn't be both boys. It would be uh, obviously Peter's. But... Uh, uh, they didn't find any meat in there, and actually, actually probably they 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 may have even asked Pete, uh, John as well. What did he last have for for dinner? Um, they would have checked that just to detect if there were any other kind of poisons in there. Uh, question eight: Where did Eleanor spend the rest of her life? That was Broadmoor Psychiatric Prison. Uh, it's still a well, it's 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 a psychiatric hospital slash prison. Uh, what treatments did they did I say this one before question 9 I can't remember if I did I might have skipped this one like an idiot brain's not working question 9 what treatments did they offer in hospital that was at Shenley Hospital uh, different treatments they offered uh, was viral therapy this was where uh, they'd worked out this is kind of what they're doing a lot at the moment which is uh, they give you a different type of uh, virus and that counteracts the disease that you have. So this was malaria therapy. So they give you malaria because they could cure. They worked out that they had kind of a, a way to control malaria or, or partly cure it. Uh, but by giving you malaria, then it would take away other symptoms and things like that. Uh, they could put you into drug induced comas. This was a, a, a treatment they were trying at that moment. Insulin injections. Uh, this was to help cure, curb psychotic episodes uh, and electroconvulsive therapy which is where they put the electrodes on your on your head and they and apparently it re 
resets like the the chemical balance in your brain oh dear uh question 10 oh i'm tired question 10 over the smell of car fumes fumes cannabis and chicken shops what is the unusually sweet smell you can detect in Harleston. Again, I've ruined this question because I've just mentioned it before, I think. Uh, that was the biscuit factory. It's the smell of biscuits being burnt out because of the McVitie's factory. See, yeah, I did balls it up, didn't I? Because I mentioned that. Oh, I got burp now. Oh, good. That was that. I think that's everything. So, uh, onwards and upwards going to start working on the new episode now well i'm going to start editing this because this is something you've heard the edited version but i haven't because this is just still me recording it i'm going to sit down going to start editing this going to start working on the next episode uh the next year of podcasts is still to come uh la- new laptop here it's going well so that's all good i've got my old laptop still so if this breaks i've got my old laptop I've got two generators uh a regular generator and a backup generator so we can do that if all the fu- uh, petrol reserves run out <gasps> i've got enough fuel in my engine to last about two years so we can i can still do podcasting uh everything's all going to be okay as long as we still have the internet yeah can imagine life without the internet we are oh, what a nightmare anyway that's it that's this episode done hope you enjoyed that uh, i'm gonna have some cake i'm gonna have some tea uh everyone have a good life wash your hands I'm gonna say it again wash your hands wash your hands keep soap water uh the antiseptic thing wear gloves there's loads in the shops it's weird or, or as i've been doing i've been walking around wearing my washing up gloves big thick rubber gloves walking around the supermarket don't look like a weirdo because everyone's like good good he's wearing gloves and then when you get back you do your washing up and they're you know you they're in hot water and you're all clean and then you but you can you can sanitize them as well perfect so there's no excuse not to wear gloves wear gloves and if you see people not wearing gloves say where are your gloves i see you wearing a mask where are your gloves where are your gloves I'm gonna keep repeating it where are your gloves right <laughs> Oh, that's it. That's done. Hope everyone's well, and uh, we will we will meet again. Best wishes. Uh, be good. Stay safe. Bye bye.